Oh, like you are currently muted if you're giving us instructions. Yeah, sorry, I was just saying I forgot, I completely forgot to start the live cast, Haley, but I have started oh, okay. it now. And now it's live casting, okay. now it's. Okay. Um, my slide has just disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Sure, no, right? okay. Okay. Should I go over that bit of, again, or shall I just jump to the next slide? Yeah, I, th I think just, yeah. Yeah, do a brief introduction again. Sorry about this. Uh, okay, uh, sure. So, so I'm going to talk, I'll mention, uh, uh, my topic is what makes quasars tinkle. So I'll talk about some rapid interstellar scintillation that, that quasars um, undergo in the interstellar medium. And uh, this is a bit of a personal research history for me for the last 20 years as well, and sort of, um, up to the present and future directions that we're going in with it. So uh, next slide, thanks, Oleg. Just as an outline, I'll talk, uh, in case you haven't heard of Manly Astrophysics, it's quite a small institute, I'll um, give a brief introduction and then a brief introduction of what is scintillation. And uh, then the rest of the talk will be spent on um, interstellar scintillation of AGN, and in particular intra hour variables and what they tell us about the local interstellar medium. Next slide, please, Oli. Okay, so this is just the web page of, of Manly Astrophysics. You can, you can go and have, I encourage you to go and have a look at it if you're curious about the, the research of the Institute. It's, um, so it's, it's called Manly Astrophysics because the headquarters are in. Manly, uh, which is a beautiful beachside suburb of Sydney, but I'm based in Perth, uh, which is also a nice place, but um, on the other side of the country. Um, so Manly Astrophysics is a bit unusual for Australian research institutes. It's um, funded by charitable donations, essentially. And uh, it's, it's the vision of our director, Mark Walker. You can go to the next slide, actually. Thanks, Oleg. It's a little bit more about the... Institute that's just from a web page as well. So um, Manly Astrophysics has a research committee or board which sort of sets the scientific priorities and approves um, appointments and stuff. And so we have currently five staff um, shown at the bottom of that slide there. Um, so uh, I'm part time and I've been uh, working for just over a, a year with the, with the team at Manly Astrophysics but I'm pretty, pretty much on my own at Perth. So I'm also a visiting scientist at CSIRO and I can go and use the facilities there, which is just quite good. Hopefully I'll actually get across to Sydney after a long time of, of not, uh, not being there um, for a few days at least later in the year. So thanks, we'll keep going. We'll move on to the science part now. So um, this is just a, a little cartoon of the physics of scintillation in general. So um, we have radio waves coming from a distant compact source um, that are scattered by electron density fluctuations in intervening media. In this case, uh, we can effectively consider a, a thin phase changing screen that scatters, sorry, that scatters the uh, radio waves and then the um, subsequent interference between the scattered waves produces uh, at the observer uh, an intensity scintillation pattern. So the observer is moving with some velocity with respect to this pattern. They'll see changes in the flux density of the source with time. Uh, you might recognize a dish of the Westerbork telescope there. Um, you can go to the next slide if you prefer to see a. Um, mathematical representation, um, which I don't generally in a talk, but some people do. <laughs> so, um, everything kind of uh, can be derived from this equation, if you like. It's, uh, it describes how, um, yeah, essentially a phase change introduced by the screen, and then um, it propagates the radiation, then propagates to the observer plane. And an important scale, the only thing I'll note is that an important scale is this is the, in the, is the Fresnel scale. Um, so that's a, a geometric term, even in the bottom left corner there, um, geometric optics. And um, so the, the scale of the, the phase fluctuations with respect to that scale is important for 
for what we actually observe um, due to scintillation. You can go to the next slide, please, Oleg. Skip quick, fairly quickly through this. But um, so when you have an extended source instead of just a point source, you have to consider um, what the scintillation pattern looks like in that case. And it's uh, people that already looked at this in the 1960s for interplanetary scintillation. So um, they, um, yeah, so in this case, um, you just uh, essentially are summing up the, the scintillation patterns of the, all the elements in the, in the source over its finite angular diameter. Um, and uh, so if you go on to the next slide, I think it shows sort of what happens if you have an extended source. So this is a simulation, old simulation that I got at some point from Barney Rickard, at least got the image. Um, so it shows the scintillation of a point source on the left. And then if you have an extended source with respect to the, the Fresnel scale in this case, um, it's a, you gradually sort of smear out this scintillation pattern and eventually a source will be, have a too large an angular diameter to, to show the scintillation effect. And it's as simple as when you look at the night sky, stars twinkle, whereas planets don't because they, they're um, too large on the sky. So, so the scintillation pattern contains information on source structure. So that's, that's uh, an important aspect too, but I'm going to talk more about uh, I'm going to be focusing on what the scintillation can tell us about the, the medium, the scattering medium in this talk. So you can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, okay, so this plot on the left is rather complicated, again, from a paper by Barney Rickert, um, 20 years old, but um, it's, uh, it's quite informative. It shows the, the uh, the three different regimes of scintillation and the um, you have uh, below a certain frequency which is called the transition frequency where the the medium introduces uh, um, essentially a turn of a turn of phase over the Fresnel scale um, below that you have uh, lots of turns of phase over the over the Fresnel scale and you're in strong scattering um, and so there's two branches of that refractive scintillation and diffractive scintillation. Diffractive is, is a narrow band, sort of short time scale phenomenon and, and seen for pulsars, which are extremely compact. Um, whereas AGN at low frequencies show this low frequency variability. Um, so say at 100 megahertz, you get um, the time scale involved can be some months to years. Um, Whereas uh, around gigahertz frequencies, you get into this interesting transition region between strong and weak scattering, and you can actually get very large, uh, large amplitude modulations um, near that transition frequency. Um, and then about that higher frequencies, you're into weak, weak scattering, which is sort of a broadband effect. So um, there's uh, the main point here was that AGN, uh, only the most compact AGN, so that it, these three lines represent an angular size cutoff um, and a source that um, essentially much larger than that will not show scintillation. So only very compact high brightness temperature AGN components scintillate in the interstellar medium, typically. Um, so they typically have to be sort of sub milli arc second scale at gigahertz frequencies. Um, I think you can go on to the next slide there. Sorry. So this is an example of, of scintillation. Which, um, so this was published in the 1980s. Um, uh, this is from the Effelsberg telescope. So Dave Heshen um, sort of discovered initially flickering of, of sources on time scales of several days with the, with the Green Bank telescope and then uh, went to Bonn, worked with the group there, including Arno Witzel. Um, and they discovered uh, sort of shorter term fluctuations at five gigahertz. So it was, became known as intraday variability. So the, there's a couple of very famous IDV quasars shown here, typical variations of a, of a few percent on the time scales shorter than a, a day. And there was a lot of debate at that stage over, it wasn't really clear whether this was scintillation or intrinsic effects because bazaars are known to vary intrinsically. 
and uh, you could just about explain the, although the brightness temperatures, implied brightness temperatures are very high, it's an intrinsic variation and you might expect it to then scintillate as well. Um, and I think uh, it didn't really become clear until a bit later um, that, uh, that this is probably um, all interstellar scintillation for side EV centimetre wavelengths. Quasars. You can go to the next slide. Thanks, Oleg. So this is Park C4 5 minus V85, which was the first um, inter-hour variable quasar discovered. So um, it was discovered by Lucina Kajora Futsa as part of her PhD project looking for intraday variability. And this was really quite unprecedented variable um, because it varied by sort of up to a Jansky in, in as little as an hour at five gigahertz. The, the light curves on the on the left show five and eight gigahertz variability on one particular day in June 1996, I believe, I think. And um, when they saw this, um, of course, the first thought was, of, is, the, is the telescope broken or something? So um, Lucina's supervisor, Dave Jauncey, apparently got on the phone to George Nicholson at, at Heart of Eastook. And the, uh, the, the right-hand side of the the curves there are actually measurements from heart, which uh, confirm that indeed the this extreme IDV was real. The compact ray wasn't just wasn't broken. Um, so that um, was quite an exciting discovery, and that was just before I started my PhD. Um, so the inferred brightness temperature, if it's intrinsic, is extremely high, and also if it's scintillation, actually. Um, the brightness temperature is difficult to explain using uh, what was um, thought to be a sort of standard model of, of interstellar medium for, um, for scintillation. Um, another thing about this source is that the, the episodes of, of extreme IDV only lasted for, sort of for a few weeks or months. I showed a couple of episodes over a few years, so they kept looking at it, monitoring it for a few years, but it only showed these extreme periods of variability over, um, over a few weeks at a couple of periods. Um, so I think that, oh, so you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Oleg. So um, this just shows the, uh, that same source, uh, like it's over three days um, at four different frequencies the, measured with the compact array. So, um, it's, it's very naturally explained in the, as interstellar scintillation where you have 4.8 and 8.6 gigahertz are in weak scattering. 4.8 is near the transition frequency and that's where you see the largest amplitude variations. And below that you have um, refractive scattering, um, refractive scintillation in the strong scattering regime. And that the typically sort of lower amplitude and longer time scale variations compared with the um, near the transition. Um, so that was well modelled as interstellar scintillation, although still um, problematic for what was, um, for, yes, sort of a screen, say, at, um, a distance of maybe hundreds of parsecs. But as it turned out, that's probably not the case. You can go to the next slide. Thanks, Oleg. <clears throat> So, um, so shortly after this, sort of actually a couple of years after, um, there was a, another intra-hour variable quasar discovered at Westerbork, which shows even shorter time scale and larger fractional modulations than Park C405. So Jane Dennett Thorpe and Pierre de Brown um, found, uh, found this source with Westerbork. Um, and uh, this was a more persistent scintillator. It showed that that rapid inter-hour variability over a number of years. And um, at certain times of the year, it actually slows down, which I'll explain on the next slide. So it shows this annual cycle in scintillation time scale. And that allows you to, to um, infer the scale of the scintillation pattern because you have this, um, oh, I'll show you on the next slide actually. But um, that um, they then suggest, actually they suggested I think earlier than that, that the scattering may be a lot closer to the observer within tens of parsecs. And then that means that the, um, the angular Fresnel scale is, um, is actually, a, can be larger. So the source can have a larger angular size. 
um, and that reduces the, the extreme brightness temperature required for the source because it can be significantly larger angular size. And they suggested already at that time that uh, perhaps the scattering might be associated with, um, uh, with the star Vega because the, that was fairly close to the line of sight to this quasar. So there may be something. I'll come back to that um, at the end of, or towards the end of the talk as well. So uh, next slide, please. So th this is just an explanation of the annual cycle. So um, essentially it's a, just a result of the changing relative velocity of the Earth in its orbit with respect to the scattering screen. So um, you can look at the time scale or the rate of scintillation, which is the inverse of time scale. Um, it's, it's just a function of the scale of the scintillation pattern and that relative velocity. Um, and uh, so this is, the, that equation is for an anisotropic scintillation pattern where you, so you've got an elliptical characteristic pattern. Um, and when you have, turns out when you have high anisotropy, so um, the first term, so if, if it's essentially infinite, um, a, a parallel is essentially infinite, the major axis, and it's only the, um, that first term sort of disappears and it's only the, um, the perpendicular component of the, um, for the perpendicular scale, <laughs> the, the, the minor axis of the scintillation pattern and the velocity along that direction. That's important um, on determining the scintillation rate. So you can at least constrain those, um, that perpendicular, direction. Um, so obviously if you if you don't have such high anisotropy, it's the more there are more parameters. But uh, you can go into the next slide, thanks Oleg. What we find is that um, actually totally anisotropic scintillation um, is required to explain a lot of uh, these intra-hour variables that we see. So, um, so this is another IHP quasar. So around that that time of the discovery of J1819, I was doing my PhD on the sort of variability of blazars and um, yeah, this IDV topic was coming in. I was, um, uh, so I was working a bit with Dave Johnson and Latina at the time as well. So, um, so I was sort of looking at my data for inter-hour variables as well, and, um, or intraday variables at least. And I found this one, which was um, so by chance, but um, unexpected, but it turned out to be another intra hour variable. And so we went off and, and uh, took lots of data with the compact array and measured an annual cycle for that. And um, another neat thing you can do with these, these intra hour variables is the um, measure a pattern arrival time delay between widely separated telescopes. So we managed to get simultaneous observations between the VLA and compact array. Um, at a few times of the year. And we saw this clear um, pattern arrival time delay of several minutes between the, the VLA and the compact array, which varied at, over the course of the year as well. So we, we sort of can use both of those. Um, uh, we use the combined fitting to the annual cycle plus the two station time delay to, to determine the kinematic parameters, the velocity of the scattering screen, as well as the scale of the scintillation pattern and the anisotropy in the scintillation pattern. Um, so you can go into the next slide, colleague. So, so yeah, all of these intra-hour variable sources that were known at that time um, had this extremely anisotropic scintillation, so effectively one-dimensional, and also the, the implications of the, the, um, the IHV is that the screens are very nearby, so the you can determine the, the pattern scale and then relate that to the Fresnel scale. Um, and uh, there is a fair bit of uncertainty in the screen distance because it's only um, a square root dependence of the, the distance on the, the pattern, even though the pattern scale in at least that perpendicular direction is well constrained. Um, but the, the screens are constrained to be within, at least within a few tens of parsecs um, from us. So there's not that many that much stuff in the interstellar medium. So it was a bit surprising, or that we not knew about, sorry. So it was a bit surprising to find all these sources at the time. 
but they um they are quite rare so that tells us that the covering fraction is not not huge but uh um, as we'll see, there are more being found. So uh, you can go on to the next slide. Thanks, Oleg. So what are these, um, what are these screens that are causing, nearby screens that are causing scintillation? Um, so Mark Walker had this idea um, that, uh, um, or a revelation in some, <laughs> some sense, I guess, that, that um, the long axis of the scintillation pattern is sort of pointing towards a, a nearby star on the line of sight within um, sort of a parsec or two um, in projection for, um, for both J1819 and Parks 1257, which we had determined the, the kinematics from the annual cycle. So there's an association between J1819 and Vega and between uh, Parks 1257 and the star Al Hakim. Um, which is uh, something like 30 parsecs away. So um, there's, there seems to be a match between the, the velocity of the, of this compared for the scattering screen and the stellar velocity as well. So um, the picture that, um, that Mark Walker came up with was that you have these um, sort of, um, um, a little bit like uh, the helix nebula, which has these lovely um, cometary knots. Um, you might have uh, sort of tiny molecular clouds around the star, the, these normal stars, these hot stars, which are then ionized. And um, so it's this ionized material sort of in, the, in, in filamentary structures around the star that, that's causing the scintillation. So, and it seems unlikely that you'd see these alignments by chance in each case. But of course, when we look to find other things that we've got a little bit more complicated, we can go into the next slide. Thanks, Oleg. So um, what led to that idea was uh, going backwards a little bit, but um, extreme scattering events are another phenomenon that occur, um, which are, again, galactic, um, due to galactic structures. So they are refractive lensing events on the, might be a bit hard to see the light curves on the right hand side, but um, these are sort of uh, symmetrical, as you can see on the left hand part, there's sort of a symmetrical dip with, um, with peaks on either side, if you like. So that's a sort of lens like characteristic extreme scattering event. So um, um, you have some, um, so these were discovered in the 1980s as well. And this was a, a compact array survey started by Keith Bannister that was uh, looking at finding, um, finding ESEs to try and work out what, what they are, what's causing those. Um, so we were able to, to model that, that one um, in the science paper, but also uh, so there's the light curves on the top and the dynamic spectrum underneath. And you can see that after the ESE itself, there's still continued sort of variations in the light curve. So this ESE is typically happen on the time scale there is um, over, over a year or something. So the, the ESE is a sort of weeks to months. So um, yeah, Keith's neat idea to find them was actually to monitor about a thousand sources um, to, to look at their spectra every month or so the broadband spectra with the compact array and, and changes in the spectra would be indicative of sort of particular changes in the spectra. Appearance of caustics would be uh, indicative of, a, of an ESE. And these things only occur at a rate of about one per 200 compact sources per year. So they're, they're kind of hard to find just um, in uh, sort of standard monitoring programs. But uh, we also found in that survey a bunch of new intraday variables as well. So there's uh, sort of the question of what's the connection between ESEs and scintillation. And in fact, uh, so it was one of these intraday variables. If you go on to the next slide, please, Oleg. Um, so this uh, IDV source, um, another parks 1322 minus 110, I think it's coordinates are. Um, was found in the ATZ survey. Um, and so that was more normal IDV. In fact, it turned out to be quite rapid IDV. And we took, um, so we've looked at it over 
over the course of a year with a compact ray. Um, and uh, Tioma Tunsov, one of, uh, one of my collaborators, has come up with quite a neat way to uh, measure, so to do, do a sort of global fit to the time scale, because you can see that there are certain light curves there where there's no variations in that particular epoch. So um, it's hard to estimate a time scale from that. So he actually fits to the rate, which is a little bit better behaved because it goes to zero. Um, <clears throat> when the, the time scale is essentially going to infinity. Um, so yes, his, his algorithm, um, oh, it's explained in this paper anyway, and the, and the um, uh, which although I'm first author on was actually, um, Tiomu was the contact author and did the vast but majority of the work in that paper. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so that showed a nice annual cycle. And the thing about the source was we noticed it was very close to the star speaker. And uh, so that, in fact, was um, what led to Mark Walker's idea about this hot star association, because uh, this source also appears to be associated with material around speaker. Seems, um, um, so there's now these three sources that uh, that seem to have these associations with material around hot stars. So um, that gave some weight to the picture. But if we go on to the next slide, please. So um, yeah, this was uh, in the meantime, um, uh, Wan Ming Wang, who's a student of Tara Murphy at, at Sydney, um, had found uh, a bunch of fast variables at 21 centimeters in a with, uh, with um, ASCAP. So uh, essentially, yeah, ASCAP has a has a very wide field of view, of course. Um, and uh, there was uh, observations to look at a a field with a gravitational wave candidate, um, gravitational wave detection. Sorry. So it's known as the LIGO field, I think. Um, so that uh, ASCAP stared at that field for several hours um, and did repeated observations over uh, every couple of months for, for a year or so. Um, and in the field, there appeared these, uh, these very fast variables at 21 centimetres, which is quite unexpected. So um, you might recall from the other, the other scintillating sources showed uh, the other IHV sources showed variations, rapid variations at sort of five gigahertz and above, but down at the down at the 1.4 gigahertz, they were not doing very much over a day. So the time scale was much, much slower. So this is a bit unexpected and um, it implies probably that the scattering is extremely close, sort of a, less than a few parsecs away. And also, of course, these sources are more compact. They're very faint sources that you're seeing now. So, um, so they can be a bit more compact and then uh, and also show more, uh, more scintillation at, at the lower frequencies. Um, so what was remarkable about this was there was uh, several, several sources, the six or so sources, detected in the same field showing rapid scintillation. And five of them are, li are lined along an almost perfectly straight line there, implying a filament that's of, uh, almost two degrees long, but only uh, minutes wide at the most. So um, that's a really unprecedented um, result. So you see it seems to be tracing out this plasma filament on the sky. Um, so that was really remarkable. I think you can go into the next slide and there's another related plot from that paper. Um, oh, that's just showing the annual cycle fits for, for the six of the rapid variables. So um, yeah, the other thing is the, the, the angle of um, anisotropy in the, the scattering. In other words, so the scattering is sort of one dimensional, but it's uh, um, the, the long axis is not lined up with that plasma, it was almost perpendicular. Um, so that suggests it's not sort of a magnetically confined filament. 
Um, so there's no no nearby hot star or um, a, there was no sort of HR for um, structure or anything um, found in that uh, in other wavelengths in, in that region of the sky. So the authors suggested that the plasma might be, so it's not consistent with the this hot stars idea, but they suggested that the plasma might be a trace component within a cold neutral gas stream. And they interpret that stream as a, as a tidal remnant. So it could be some tiny molecular cloud that's been, a tiny neutral cloud that's been disrupted. Um, uh, so tidally disrupted. Um, so that's a, another idea. And I think you can go on to the next slide, please. So, uh, and the, uh, yeah, so the similar time. So, um, uh, Aperitif at Westerbork, also with a, with a nice wide field of view, to Mosulu found a, uh, another intra hour variable. And this one's just incredible. It's a really, really fast variations um, at 21 centimeters. And again, there's this beautiful annual cycle seen in the time scale of variations. Um, and this was actually discovered from uh, initially from artifacts in the image. You see on the left hand side there, see these spokes. Of course, Westerbork is, a, is an east west array. And you get these, uh, these bicycle spokes, if you like, due to, due to the flux variations from that source. Um, and so they've extracted the light curve from, from this variable source. And I believe Aperitif's actually found a number of other um, fast variables as well. I don't think they're published yet, so I haven't heard much about them. Um, but yeah, so this also there's a, um, it's not quite clear what's causing the, the variations. The, the authors of this paper suggest that it might be even something within the Oort cloud. And um, Mark Walker, there's also this uh, possible star, um, plausible stellar association, but that is uh, at some, the star's about 30 parsecs away, I think. So the authors are the, um, they sort of argue that maybe, uh, um, well, that would imply a very compact, unusually compact source. So um, they're sort of doubtful about that, but it's really not clear what, uh, what the origin of the screen in that case is. Um, so you can go on to the next slide, I think. Colin. And this is another, yes, another inter variable quasar that we found uh, in the follow up to the to the Atezi survey. I guess when we <laughs> changed direction to look at the uh, the inter hour variables again to try and test the hot star hypothesis. So we found this is our sort of best candidate, and uh, the uh, it's quite close to projected distance to this star uh, Alpha Ophiuchi or uh, Russell Hag. Um, which is a star about uh, less, about 15 parsecs away. Um, so uh, A type star, I think. Um, uh, but and it shows a beautiful annual cycle that repeats and, and the time scale, but um, it's not consistent with the, the Walker et al. model of the, um, the, uh, the nice plasma, uh, sorry, the, uh, the filament pointing towards the, the hot star, the, neither the velocity or the, um, the angle of anisotropy that we found are, are consistent with this hot star's idea. Um, we can go on to the next slide, thanks. So that's published recently. Um, but one thing I did notice when I was looking at this association is that there was some, there are some papers on absorption towards Russell Hug. Um, so it shows unusual uh, calcium two absorption in, in optical that has been known for decades. And um, more recently, uh, so Redfield um, has uh, inferred that there's a filamentary interstellar cloud in, in that direction by looking at uh, the absorption towards Russell Hag and also several other stars in the field, um, that there appears to be this filamentary structure. So uh, we suggest that the, and that must be within 14.9 parsecs because um, 
uh, that's the distance of, of alpha of the UV, alpha hug. So we suggest that maybe the scintillation is associated with, uh, with that interstellar cloud that's known from optical wavelengths. But um, uh, at the moment, we don't have a, it's, it's a bit of a stretch. We don't have a, a definite counterpart. Um, so what, one thing that we um, are doing is looking if there might be an H1 absorption counterpart or something. Um, but it's uh, not that clear from compact array data that we've got at the moment. There doesn't seem to be anything at the velocity of interest. Um, anyway, there's, there's some interesting sort of avenues to explore with these things, uh, trying, to, trying to work out exactly what's going on. But if you go on to the next slide, thanks. I think that's a summary. So um, the scintillation of, um, so the thing I guess about the, what scintillation does is it's probing these small scale structures in the interstellar medium that are otherwise not very easily detectable. But uh, these, well, essentially a form of dark matter possibly because, uh, but ordinary matter. Um, so it may, may explain some of the missing baryons, for example. Um, we don't really know the, how much stuff is, is locked up. So of course this, this sort of ties into broader ideas that, um, um, that Mark Walker has that, they're, that are, well, not that new, but that there might be a population essentially of tiny molecular clouds. Um, there's, um, although the, the survivability has sort of been dismissed in the past, the, um, there are new avenues being explored where actually it looks like um, cold molecular hydrogen, in fact, could survive in the interstellar medium. So Mark's um, published some papers related to that. But, um, but this is just a, a perspective one sort of aspect of, of probing these unknown structures in the interstellar medium, I guess. So the kinematic parameters revealed by these annual cycles in fast scintillating sources, um, we, can, we can tie down the, um, to some extent the distance and the, the velocity and, uh, of the scattering screens and, uh, <clears throat> and possibly relate them to structures at, at other wavelengths, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, the, it might be that. So the hot stars idea doesn't seem to uh, be be correct. For the the idea of of the cometary knots around hot stars is not causing all of the scintillation we see. So there probably is a variety of phenomena that are generating the the scattering screens that we're looking at. So tidally disrupted clouds, for example, um, and uh, so. Uh, I just know that, yeah, the intra hour variable at variability at 21 centimetres was unexpected. So that uh, implies very, very local scattering. Um, and also, of course, we, as we go to fainter sources in these surveys, um, we see more compact sources too. Um, whereas the, the brighter sources are obviously uh, tend to be larger um, for a given brightness temperature. So, so we expect the ASCAP variables and slow transient survey to, to find more of these fast scintillators and hopefully we'll be able to, to follow up some of them for annual cycles. Um, I think I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Haley, for a great talk. Uh, would people who have questions raise their hand in Zoom or raise their hand in the room? Uh, I see, okay, I see David was first. Yeah, I was, um, I was very intrigued by the slide of the ESE event that showed uh, optical scintillation as well. And it just called to mind that I believe that there is a proposal to exploit Rubin Observatory LSST in the search of optical scintillation. I just wondered whether you have any um, interest in that or knowledge of that. Um, I don't personally. So that was the light curve I showed was just radio actually, but there is, um, uh, yeah, our, the group or Mark and Tioma have been looking at um, sort of gas lensing, which is 
um, which may have some bearing on optical um, wavelengths because it's more or less, they find it's more or less wavelength independent, at least in the radio band which is unusual because this refractive, um, refractive scintillation, refractive scattering, refractive lensing, obviously has a strong wavelength dependence. Because I thought I saw Gemini and Smarts. Ah, oh, uh, sorry, yes, I didn't explain that and put that, so <laughs> I probably showed a too complicated plot. We actually did get, we got optical observations um, at the same time, yeah, to try to see if there was any optical um, associations or uh, anything unusual in absorption. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, that's true, actually. I think they're just showing, uh, they're just the points at the top showing where we got optical observations, sorry, but there's not actually data plotted there. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the data is just the compact array data that's shown, and the uh, the other points are just sort of where where observations are taken. So, for example, we have VLBI as well as optical to try and um, to um, to try and determine if if yeah, there's uh, well for the VLBI if there's any position shifts in the due to the lensing event or um, in the optical if there's any strange absorption that that shows up, for example, but that might be associated with the NESC cloud. Um, so I'm not, uh, yeah, I, actually, because it wasn't the main topic of my talk, it was just <laughs> it was a bit of an aside to how we started finding more um, IDVs, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, the ESC, ESCs are definitely interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so the optical lens, um, optical scintillation is interesting. I'd be interested to read a bit more. I don't, I'm not aware. I'm not that well aware of, of what's being done, but it, there could could be some ties into to uh, sort of for this this scattering scintillation in the radio as well. Cool. I think we had another question in the room there. Uh, yes, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Well, you've come close to me, but it's good. Yeah. Um, thank you, Haley. I really enjoyed your talk. I had two questions, if that's okay. The first is uh, maybe slightly naive. Um, so all the scattering screens that are inferred are always very, very close to us. Is there a maximum distance uh, within the Milky Way at which we would no longer see the effect of scintillation? Um. Not really. For example, for well, it depends on the angular size of the source, I guess. So, um, so for pulsars, for example, they'll scatter from anything. They're effectively point sources for the whole galaxy. Um, but obviously, they're in the galaxy for the most part. So, um, anything between us and the pulsar. Um, for yeah, there is. So for AGN, they do because they do have a larger angular size. It's, it tends to be the nearby stuff that dominates any variability due to interstellar scintillation. But um, so more typical IDV or intraday variables are sort of um, yeah timescales of of days to to weeks even, um, and especially the low frequency variables. They're, timescales of weeks to years even, and they're gonna pick up, um, yeah, typically more distant, more distant, stronger scattering. Um, so there's not really a horizon to what we can pick up, but with the, with the intra-hour variables, I'd say, yeah, that they constrain things to be within, within tens of parsecs, typically, um, just, just uh, through the, by the geometry of the but for typical screen velocities so so um uh does that i'm not sure if that clearly <laughs> it's probably a bit waffly so yeah thank you and then um, my second question um is uh the hot star associations i might have missed it in case you did say um but what is for the cases where you have these hot star associations what's the kind of projected separation between the hot star and your scintillating quasars? Yeah, that's a good question. So for it, um, typically parsec sort of scales. So it might, in fact, for, for the one that's um, proposed for Plax 1250, I think Vega, yeah, it, it depend, they're all a bit uh, closer. I think for Speaker and 1322, it's quite small um, for 
Park Store 57 and Al Hakima was, I think, a couple of parsecs, which is actually sort of uh, larger than you might expect things to be gravitationally bound to the star. But if you have the additional mass, if you did have additional mass in molecular clouds, then that might be explainable. Um, uh, oh, sort of, uh, yeah. So we were sort of looking within a hill sphere um, when we were selecting um, targets to follow up for this, uh, for this, to test this idea. So we're looking, um, so for example, it depends on, yeah. So for example, for things around Sirius, which is very nearby, it can, it, it's a large angle, large angular area on the sky that could be within the, the hill sphere of that. But for, um, for Russell Hug, for example, yeah, which <laughs> turned out to sort of not be associated with the, the fast variable that we found. Um, it's not obviously so um the picture is more complicated <laughs> but uh yeah well thank you so much sure. i see we have a hand raised online hello Harry. they want to unmute oh hello can you hear me yes yeah so uh my question is sort of slightly related to the earlier question so uh when you look at look at these sources, you know, let's, uh, do you also look at uh, these sources uh, below one gigahertz for ISS? And if in the, that case, you uh, how would you separate out the interplanetary scintillation uh, that might also, you know, sort of uh, come along with these signals? I'm not sure if this um, is the right question, but yeah. Yeah, it's a good question because um, RPS is important at this very low frequencies as well it's, uh, but IPS is typically on the really short time scales like so seconds so um, and that will affect sources that are that are much less compact as well um, so yeah I think that the time scales of of interstellar scintillation are, are, are considerably longer than than IPS time scales and it's yeah um, like I would say we don't expect to see much below a gigahertz but we do obviously with us caps um, I think that actually the the that uh, those observations were at about 900 megahertz. So we do obviously see some intra-hour variable variability at very low frequencies. But yeah, what, um, then you know if if indeed the the Westerbork source was associated with something in the Oort cloud at some point, it's sort of <laughs> um, yeah, you're getting close to interplanetary scintillation, I guess. Um, so yeah, but they're just they're just slightly different scales. No, because I, I think uh, at, at almost at one gigahertz, you're still in the strong scattering regime even for the ISS, right? So, um, um, so, uh, so yeah. So, because I was I was just try, uh, trying to understand how uh, the intra how variability uh, might probably have some IPS signals in it. So how would you separate them out? So that was the uh, thought I had. Um. Yeah, yeah, okay, it could do actually. Um, so with IPS residuals in patch, that's, that's a good question. Um, I suppose uh, you would expect most of the IPS to average out over, yeah, if you're looking at sort of, they, they probably contribute a sort of residual noise if the IPS signals were say on timescales of seconds um, or sub-seconds even, whereas the, the uh, variations we're looking at are sort of minutes or, or longer for, for interstellar scintillation. Um, I, I think it would just be sort of a noise-like effect that it might be hard to separate without that high time resolution, I guess. But um, then there's uh, diosphere. Yeah, so that comes as a from for low frequencies and. Um, Yeah, um, I was gonna say so. So for very nearby screens, I guess the scattering is not is not super strong. Presumably, it's not super strong scattering that we're looking at in these very nearby screens at, at one gigahertz. Um, so yeah, there's all, all these different scintillation phenomena that are important. <laughs> important and, um, Cool. Any more? Oh, we have a question from Ludwig online. Ludwig. Hi. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, 
could you, for example, do it the other way around? Instead of looking for scintillation and then associating it with nearby stars, could you start with, say, the Helix Nebula and look for uh, scintillators around that? Um, yeah, that might be might be interesting to do that. I guess because we know this um, to come between knots are there. Would they have? Yeah, at least we know that there. Would they expect to be a sort of ionized plasma around? That, I wonder. But it could be. Um, I mean, given that the helix is sort of a, is sort of a, a prototypical example of these hot stars. Yeah, that's that's right. So the idea that that Mark had was these sort of um, these molecular clouds might exist around other other stars, not just at the end of their lives, sort of thing. Um, but that that could be an interesting thing to look at, as we can certainly point the telescope with these wide field telescopes, especially. You can, um, uh, actually, what's the the problem? Might be the distance to the helix nebula. Not sure what the what's the distance to it. Um, but anyway, that might be something interesting to look at. <laughs> Thanks for the good question. Cool. Any more questions in the room? Okay. Any more questions online? I had a quick one, but that's just because I couldn't see the on this slide, slide 20. What's the time scale of the variation? Oh, yes, right. So, um, good question. I can't see the scale either. It's, um, the, the each observation is sort of a block of several hours. So the time the, these things are varying on sort of some of them varying on minutes, um, several minute time scales. Certainly, um, the, yeah, and there seems to be a lot of structure in those fluctuations as well. So whether it's some sort of diffractive component, I guess they they can't they don't have enough um, sensitivity to look for uh, wavelength dependence possibly, but. Uh, and then, yeah, anyway, it's, a, it's sort of interesting if these sort of tiny fluctuations are real or just noise, I'm not sure. It's, it's obviously fairly complicated processing that needs to happen with this extraction of black coast from imaging. It's a little bit little bit different from the just, yeah, pointing at a teles uh, sort of telescope, uh, for example, the compact array at the brightest source in the field and you can do the analysis in the UV plane. It's quite nice, but so uh, one thing, um, yeah, um, yeah, anyway, so one wing has this pipeline to extract fast variables from, from all of the ASCAP data. Uh, it's quite nice, but uh, there are a few different ways of looking at the problem too, I guess. Yeah, Ludwig has followed up that Helix Nebula is 650 light years away too far. Um, it might be, yeah, it's probably too far to cause very rapid scintillation. So it might, yeah, it might be hard to tie. That's a problem with the while we're looking at, at things within tens of parsecs is that the distance is so uncertain. You, you, you see, you'll see compact sources scintillate, but yeah, what are they scintillating? Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of tie down the, the screen distances, I guess, for small distance screen. Okay, well, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, so if you don't have any more questions, I don't see any questions online, any more questions from the room? If not, then I should let these fine people go for lunch. <laughs> thanks very much for a great talk again, Haley. And thanks everyone oh, for thanks, listening. Alex. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And we'll be in touch soon. Okay, bye, everyone. Yes. Bye. 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 I should say Rishi says hello. <laughs> Rishi says hello. All right, cool. Thanks a lot again. Uh, yeah, we'll be in touch shortly, but I'm quite interested in these subjects now, given our. Hmm? Oh, yeah. I also have some questions about the pulsar stuff, yeah, <laughs> which I should. I should. Uh... Oh, yeah. Well, we'll be. Uh, we'll be...